All right, and what were the theories that were proposed and why were they knocked down? Well, the first, the first approach was the chance approach, just to say, well, all these arrangements of, of, of uh, the bases, as they're called in DNA, the information-carrying subunits, th those arrangements were a byproduct of chance uh, assemblages of, uh, of the, the, the subunits in, the, in a prebiotic soup or something like that, some ancient ocean where you had chemicals floating around and they just kind of arranged themselves. As we began, as I began in the book to examine that in detail, I found first of all that no serious origin of life biologist has taken that seriously since the 1960s, and secondly, there was a really good reason for that: that the the complexity, the amount of information required, was way beyond what was reasonable to think that could have have uh, assembled as a result of chance assemblages. If um, you make some simple calculations about the number of possible ways there are of combining the amino acids in a protein or the, the information carrying bases in a DNA molecule, and then you compare that to the number of events that have taken place since the Big Bang, where an event is a minimal interaction of an elementary particle. It turns out that the, the, the number of combinations searched is far in excess of the number of events that have taken place since the Big Bang. So you're essentially in a situation like uh, a, a blindfolded man looking for a needle in a haystack, except the, the haystack is something the size of the universe, and, and you've got a very limited time to search that. It, it just isn't going to happen. And, right. and that's what, you know, so the scientists have, have really dismissed the chance hypothesis as not being credible. So the next approach has been to, some, to somehow combine chance with natural selection. But the big problem there is that natural selection is only a force to be reckoned with once you have life that can reproduce, produce offspring, create competition among the offspring for survival. And in other words, you want, to, you want to explain the first life, you can't invoke a process that presupposes the existence of life. And natural selection oper does that. So here's an illustration I have that, that gets across the logical problem here. There's an absent-minded philosophy of science professor. And he's walking home from his office, and he's thinking great thoughts, maybe thoughts about, who knows, DNA. And he isn't paying attention to where he's going. He's already lost his cell phone, his keys, and now he falls in a pit. It's a deep pit, 30 feet deep. He's lucky to have survived, but he, get, he dusts himself off and he says, well, no problem. I'll just go home and get a ladder. And then I'll come back, and then I'll climb out of the pit. All I need is a ladder. So he gets out of the pit, goes home, gets a ladder, comes back, jumps in the pit, and then climbs out. Now, obviously, there's something wrong with my story. And that is that it's begging the question as to how the absent-minded professor got out of the pit in the first place. And that's essentially what's going on with these proposals of prebiotic natural selection. They're begging the question of, of the origin of DNA and proteins, which is necessary to get natural selection even going. What were we trying to explain? The origin of DNA and proteins. And yet you've invoked a process that presupposes the very existence of the thing you're trying to explain in the first place. So that approach has been seen as kind of a non-starter, a dead end. And then the third approach has been to invoke basic laws of, of physics and chemistry to try to say, well, maybe we can explain the arrangements of the parts in the, the, the critical information-bearing parts of the DNA molecule as a result of forces of chemical attraction. Uh, if you look at the, chem the, the chemistry of DNA, DNA, you see on the side, on the two sides of the molecule, little P's and little pentagons. So that, those are the sugars. The, the sugars are in the pentagonal shape. The P's are the circular phosphate molecules, okay, they're represented with circles. That's the backbone of the molecule. That isn't the part that contains the information. The information is represented by the A's, C's, G's, and T's down the interior of the spine. That's the, where the bases are, and it's the arrangement of those bases, remember, that, that conveys the information for building proteins and protein machines. Now, the question is, could you explain the information in DNA as a result of forces of chemical attraction? Turns out you can't. If you look closely at the molecule on the screen, 
you see that they're little sticks. The stick represent chemical bonds, forces of attraction at work in the molecule. Notice that there's bonds between the sugars and the phosphates. There's also bonds between the bases and the sugar phosphate backbone. But notice that there are no bonds, no sticks connecting the bases in the vertical axis. That's the information bearing axis, and yet there's no chemistry that's dictating how one base interacts with the next. In other words, no chemistry dictating the sequential arrangement of the bases. Mm -hmm. Now, I've got a, a, a visual analogy that makes Good. this point really clear. This is a message that I got recently. <laughs> well, actually, I, I thought of this first when my kids were small. Now, I'm, now I have a son in college, so this is a message that I might have gotten from him. Dad, send money. <laughs> now, I used to get these messages on, the, on the, the refrigerator because it was a metallic surface, and these letters have little magnets in them. Okay, So you have forces of attraction that, are, that can explain why the letters stick to the backbone just as you, or backboard, the chemical, the, right. the, the magnetic backboard, just as you have forces of attraction that explain why the, the characters that convey the information in DNA stick to the chemical backbone. Okay, so the forces of attraction explain that, but do they explain the sequencing? Notice that there are no magnetic forces at work between these letters. That, that's, they're not causing the letters to arrange themselves. They, the magnet, magnetic forces only explain why the letters stick. The sequence is not determined by the magnetism. And I can demonstrate that by just rearranging the letters, destroying the information that was here, and you got the same magnetic forces in play. The same thing is true in the DNA molecule. The forces of attraction that are responsible for the message-bearing text sticking to the backbone are not responsible for the arrangement of the characters. And you can see that if you examine the chemical structure of DNA. So the self-organizational idea that forces of attraction are dictating the sequencing turns out to be completely inconsistent with what we know about the chemistry of DNA. And so that theory has failed as well. And the first guy to admit it was actually the guy who originated the theory, Professor Dean Kenyon. This has been an ATRI production.